For this video, I will be discussing to you the crimes of arbitrary detention in Article 124, delay in the delivery of detained persons to the proper judicial authorities in Article 125, delaying release in Article 126, and expulsion in, in Article 127. Again, we have our usual disclaimer. Now, the crimes I mentioned a while ago are just some of the crimes against the fundamental laws of the state. There are actually 10 crimes under this phrase, crimes against the fundamental laws of the state. So, before discussing those four crimes, let me give you the list no, of what are the crimes under this phrase, crimes against the fundamental laws of the state. Actually, they are found in Title 2 of Book 2 of the Revised Penal Code and labeled under the same title, Crimes Against the Fundamental Laws of the State. So, to repeat, we have Article 124, the crime of arbitrary detention. Article 125, delay in the delivery of detained persons to the proper judicial authorities. Article 126, delaying release. We also have Article 127, expulsion, Article 128, violation of domicile, Article 129, search warrants maliciously obtained and abuse in the service of those legally obtained. Then we have Article 130, searching domicile without witnesses, Article 131, prohibition, interruption, dissolution of peaceful meetings. Article 132, Interruption of Religious Worship. And last but not the least, Article 133, Offending the Religious Feelings. Why do they violate the fundamental laws of the state? They violate the fundamental laws of the state because they violate some provisions or certain provisions in the Bill of Rights. For example, in Article 3, Section 1, it states here, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall any person be denied the equal protection of the laws. What is being punished in Articles 124, 125, and 126, as we will discover later, is the unlawful deprivation of liberty. Also, we have Article 3, Section 6. It states here, the liberty of abode and of changing the same within the limits prescribed by law shall not be impaired except upon lawful order of the court. Neither shall the right to travel be impaired except in the interest of national security, public safety, or public health as may be provided by law. Here, what is being punished is Article 27, which is the unlawful expulsion of a person from the Philippines or compelling a person to change his residence. We also have Article 3, Section 2. It states, The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures of whatever nature and for any purpose shall be inviolable, and no search warrant or warrant of arrest shall issue except upon probable cause to be determined personally by the judge after examination under oath or affirmation of the complainant and the witnesses he may produce and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. What is being punished in Articles 128, 129, and 130 is the unlawful entry in and search and seizure of certain articles in the house of a person. Then also, Article 3, Section 4, it states, no law shall be passed abridging the freedom of speech, of expression, or of the press, or of the right of people to peaceably assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. What is being punished in Article 131 is the violation of a person's right peaceably to assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances. Then, in Article 3, Section 5, it states, no law shall be made respecting an establishment of religion, 
or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The free exercise and enjoyment of religious profession and worship without discrimination or preference shall forever be allowed. No religious test shall be required for the exercise of civil or political rights. What is being punished here is found in Article 132 and 133, which is the violation of the right to exercise and enjoy religious profession and worship. Let's start with Article 124, Arbitrary Detention. Any public officer or employee who, without legal grounds, detains a person shall suffer Number one, the penalty of arresto mayor in its maximum period to prison correctional in its minimum period if the detention has not exceeded three days. Number two, the penalty of prison correctional in its medium and maximum periods if the detention has continued more than three but not more than 15 days. Number three, the penalty of prison mayor if the detention has continued for more than 15 days but not more than 6 months. And that of reclusion temporal if the detention shall have exceeded 6 months. The commission of a crime or violent insanity or any other ailment requiring the compulsory confinement of the patient in a hospital shall be considered legal grounds for the detention of any person. What are the elements of Article 124? Number one, that the offender is a public officer or employee. Number two, that he detains a person. Number three, that the detention is without legal ground. The term public officer here refers to a public officer whose official duty gives him the authority to arrest and detain persons. So please take note of the limited definition of the term or the word public officer for purposes of Article 124. Again, it refers only to a public officer whose official duty gives him the authority to arrest and detain persons. Examples, police officers, NBI agents, PDEA agents, barangay tanods, and to some extent, barangay captains, mayors, and governors because under the local government code, they exercise peace and order functions within their respective territorial jurisdictions. Now, while they may be vested with the authority to arrest or detain persons, they become liable when they detain a person without legal ground. How about other public officers who are not vested with the authority to arrest or detain persons? Can they become liable for arbitrary detention in Article 124? The answer is no. If these other public officers detain a person without legal ground, they become liable for some other crime but not in Article 124. In other words, they become liable for either serious illegal detention in Article 267 or slight illegal detention in Article 268. Reason? they will be regarded as acting in their private capacities here because in the crime of illegal detention, the offenders are primarily or principally private individuals. So if the offender is a public officer, but this public officer is not vested with the authority to arrest or detain a person and he detains a person without legal ground, he becomes liable not under Article 124, but for some other crime, which, as I said, the crime of illegal detention. Can a private individual be guilty of arbitrary detention? The answer is yes. A private individual will be punished as a principal if he conspires with a public officer. So, for a private individual to be liable under Article 124, there must be a public officer who performs an act in violation of the said law. And if a private individual conspires with that public officer, then he will be punished as a principal. 
Otherwise, his participation will only be that of an accomplice or an accessory. Who does the offender detain? Answer, any person, regardless of gender, race, religion, or political belief. Another question, when is there a detention? There is a detention when there is actual confinement of a person in an enclosure, like in a prison cell or in a house, or in any manner detaining and depriving him of his liberty. Take note that the law does not fix a minimum period of detention, so a detention can last, let's say, for half an hour or an hour. It doesn't matter because the law, as I said, does not fix a minimum period. What about the phrase restraint resulting from fear as discussed and held in the case of Astorga versus People? In that case, the Supreme Court ruled that if a person is restrained as a result of fear for his life, this is akin to a detention. Now, what happened in that case? In that case, the mayor refused to allow a DNR team to go home despite their pleas. And then, aside from the refusal of the mayor, the mayor's bodyguards or goons encircled the DNR team. They were all armed with rifles, and then the weapons were pointed at them. And they were only allowed to leave for, let's say, after several hours. The Supreme Court ruled that it was not just the presence of the armed men, but also the evident effect these gunmen had on the actions of the team, which proves that fear was indeed instilled in the minds of the team members to the extent that they felt compelled to stay in the barangay or in the place where they were required by the mayor to stay because they were not allowed to leave by the accused mayor in that case. So the intent to prevent the departure of the complainants and witnesses against their will is clear from the actions of the mayor when he refused to let them go and they were only allowed to leave after several hours and of course, with the added fact that they were surrounded by armed men. So that is akin to a detention. Even if they were not really detained in an enclosure like a building or a house or in a prison cell. Now, when is a detention without legal ground? A detention is without legal ground when, number one, he has not committed any crime, or when a person, number two, is not suffering from violent insanity or any other ailment requiring his or her compulsory confinement in a hospital. The phrase has not committed any crime means that the person was arrested without a warrant of arrest and thereafter detained. The issuance of a warrant presupposes that a criminal case has been filed against a person who can now be arrested by a police officer or other agents of the law. The word crime here applies to felonies defined and punished in the revised penal code and offenses defined and penalized in special penal laws. For example, X made it appear that Y falsified a document. Subsequently, X filed a complaint for falsification against Y in the fiscal's office. The fiscal found probable cause and filed an information in court. The court then issued a warrant of arrest. The police officer, pursuant to the warrant of arrest, arrested and detained Y. Those are the facts. Now here is the question. Is the police officer liable for arbitrary detention? Considering that from the facts of the case, Y has not committed any crime? The answer is no. Even if Y did not really commit a crime, it is enough that a criminal case has been filed and a warrant of arrest was issued therefore.
Are there instances where a person can be validly arrested even without a warrant of arrest? The answer is yes. Rule 113, Section 5 of the Revised Rules on Criminal Procedure provides the instances of a valid warrantless arrest. Number 1. When in the presence of a peace officer or a private person, the person to be arrested has committed, is actually committing, or is attempting to commit an offense. This is called in flagranti delicto arrest. Here, the offender was caught in the act of having committed, or he was caught in the act of actually committing, or he was caught in the act of attempting to commit a crime. Second instance, when an offense has in fact just been committed and the arresting officer has probable cause to believe based on personal knowledge of facts and circumstances that the person to be arrested has committed it. This is called the doctrine of hot pursuit. And number three, when the person to be arrested is a prisoner who has escaped from a penal establishment or has escaped while being transferred from one confinement to another. This refers to escapees. And they apply to both convicted prisoners and detention prisoners, meaning prisoners who are imprisoned because they have pending criminal cases in court and they have not posted or they were not able to post bail. If the warrantless arrest was not made in accordance with Rule 113, Section 5, and the person arrested is subsequently detained, then the police officer here becomes liable for arbitrary detention. What about the crime of unlawful arrest as defined and penalized in Article 269? How is it differentiated from the crime of arbitrary detention in, in Article 124? Here are the elements of the crime of unlawful arrest. Number one, the offender, who can be a public officer or a private individual, arrests or detains a person. So here, you can already see the distinction. Because, to repeat, in arbitrary detention, the offender is a public officer vested with the authority to arrest or detain a person. But in unlawful arrest, the offender can either be a public officer vested with the authority to detain or arrest or a private individual. Number two, or the second element, the purpose is to deliver the person arrested to the proper authorities. And number three, the arrest or detention is not authorized by law or there is no reasonable ground therefore. If the purpose of the arresting or detaining of the victim is to deliver him to the proper authorities, even if it develops that the detention is unlawful, then the crime is still unlawful arrest. Take note of that. To properly determine whether the crime committed is unlawful arrest or arbitrary detention, Take note of the motive of the offender because the motive of the offender is controlling. Why? Because if his purpose is to deliver the person arrested or detained to the proper authorities, the crime is unlawful arrest. But the absence of this motive may be shown by the length of time the victim is detained. So, motive, take note, is a state of mind. And a state of mind can only be determined by the overt acts of the offender. If from the overt acts of the offender, it is shown that he does not really have the intention to bring the person arrested or detained to the proper authorities, his intention is, was merely to detain him, then the crime committed is only arbitrary detention. For example, X, a police officer, arrests Y without legal ground and detains him at the police station for six hours. 
after which he was released. Here, the crime committed is only arbitrary detention because it is clear, as I said, that he merely detained after arresting Y, X merely detained him and then released him after six hours. There was no indication that he wanted to bring Y to the authorities or he actually brought Y to the authorities for purposes of filing a criminal complaint. So the crime, to repeat, is only arbitrary detention. Whereas in example number two, X, a police officer, goes to Y's house and arrests him for alleged possession of illegal drugs. X brought Y to and detained him at the police station. After about an hour, X brought Y before the fiscal for purposes of inquest. The crime committed here is unlawful arrest. Y's detention will be deemed an incident of the arrest. So, comparing the two examples, in example number two, it is clear that the crime committed is unlawful arrest because after X arrested and detained Y, he brought Y to the fiscal for purposes of inquest, for the purpose of filing a complaint against Y. In such a case, the crime committed is unlawful arrest. Y's detention though without legal ground, will only be deemed as an incident of the unlawful arrest. What does the statement, he is not suffering from violent insanity or any other ailment requiring compulsory confinement in a hospital mean? This means that mere insanity will not suffice. The insanity must be such as to cause disturbance to other people or endanger the public peace. If such is the case, the public officer may arrest or detain him in the meantime for the purpose of committing him to a mental hospital. We actually have a proceeding in the rules of court. It's called Proceeding for the Hospitalization of Insane Persons. Rule 101, Section 1 provides, and I quote, a petition for the commitment of a person to a hospital or other place for the insane may be filed with the RTC of the place where the person alleged to be insane is found. The petition shall be filed by the Director of Health in all cases where, in his opinion, such commitment is for the public welfare or for the welfare of said person who, in his judgment, is insane and such person or the one having charge of him is opposed to his being taken to a hospital or other place for the insane. What does this provision imply? This provision implies that if the person is not suffering from violent insanity, meaning he is just basically insane, and the one having charge of that insane person is opposed to his being taken to a hospital, meaning there is no voluntary confinement to a mental hospital, then the director of health no, in the local government unit concerned may file a petition in court for the commitment of such person. Okay? And then uh, he is to be assisted by the prosecutor in the filing of such a petition. If a person is afflicted with a highly contagious or communicable disease like COVID-19, we are in a pandemic at present. The afflicted person may be quarantined in an isolated place to prevent the spread of the disease, even against his will. And this forced quarantine will not be a violation of Article 124. No? The public officer detaining him or putting him in a quarantine facility will not be held liable for arbitrary detention because this person or that person is afflicted with an ailment which requires his confinement either in a hospital or in some other place where he cannot infect other persons. This is so provided in sections, rather in section 6E4 of Republic Act 11332.
Let's go to another point. Can there be arbitrary detention through negligence? In one case, no, decided not by the Supreme Court but by the Court of Appeals, People v. Misa, CA 36 OJ 3496, the Court of Appeals answered in the affirmative. In that case, the Chief of Police X re-arrested Y who had already been released by means of a verbal order of the court. The court held that X should have verified the order of release first before proceeding to make the re-arrest. So here, X was made liable for arbitrary detention through simple imprudence as defined and penalized under Article 124 in relation to Article 365, Paragraph 2 of the Revised Penal Code. At that time, no, although at present we are now a court of record, but there was a time when we were not a court of record, meaning the court at that time can just issue verbal orders. So in this case, the chief of police probably did not believe the verbal order of the court. He only heard it from another person and then he re-arrested why? No? On the strength of his belief that uh, there was no order. But since there was a verbal order of the court, the Court of Appeals ruled that he should have verified first the verbal order of release before proceeding to re-arrest the victim or the offended party. And since he made no confirmation or verification of the order of release before proceeding to make the re-arrest, then he was held liable for arbitrary detention through simple imprudence. But it is humbly submitted, class, know that uh, this is not controlling because the crime of arbitrary detention is a crime that is committed with malice, meaning there must be criminal intent no, to detain the person without legal ground. Let's now go to Article 125, Delay in the Delivery of Detained Persons to the Proper Judicial Authorities. Article 125, the penalties provided in the next preceding article shall be imposed upon the public officer or employee who shall detain any person for some legal ground and shall fail to deliver such person to the proper judicial authorities within the period of 12 hours for crimes or offenses punishable by light penalties or their equivalent, 18 hours for crimes or offenses punishable by correctional penalties or their equivalent, and 36 hours for crimes or offenses punishable by afflictive or capital penalties or their equivalent. In every case, the person detained shall be informed of the cause of his detention and shall be allowed upon his request to communicate and confer at any time with his attorney or counsel. What are the elements of Article 125? Number one, the offender is a public officer or employee, similar to Article 124. Number two, he has detained a person for some legal ground. And number three, he fails to deliver such person to the proper judicial authorities within letter A, 12 hours for crimes punishable by light penalties or their equivalent. Letter B, 18 hours for crimes punishable by correctional penalties or their equivalent. And letter C, 36 hours for crimes punishable by afflictive or capital penalties or their equivalent. So, you can notice in element number two that the offender here has detained a person for some legal ground. So, this is what differentiates Article 125 from Article 124 because in Article 124, the detention is without legal ground. But here in Article 125, the detention or the offender detains a person for some legal ground.
Now take note that Article 125 applies to situations enumerated in Rule 113, Section 5 of the Revised Rules on Criminal Procedure. I am referring to what I mentioned a while ago, the valid warrantless arrests. For a full discussion on valid warrantless arrests, please see the video titled, Can You Arrest a Person Without a Warrant? in my YouTube channel. Also, for a full discussion on the procedure to be undertaken by the arresting officer with respect to persons arrested without a warrant, still on warrantless arrests, also see the video titled Q&A on Inquest, also in my YouTube channel. Now, Article 125 covers those arrested under the Revised Penal Code or Special Penal Laws. I am referring to crimes defined and penalized in the RPC or in special penal laws because of the use of the phrase or their equivalent. This refers to the duration of grave, less grave, and light felonies. This is very important class. In Article 125, the detention is legal in the beginning because the person detained was arrested under the circumstances of a valid warrantless arrest. The detention becomes arbitrary when no criminal case is filed against the detained person after a certain period of time. I am referring to the 12, 18, or 36-hour reglementary period provided in Article 125. Does Article 125 apply to situations where a person is arrested by virtue of a warrant of arrest? The answer is an obvious no. There is no longer any need to bring the arrested person to the proper judicial authorities because a warrant presupposes that a criminal case had already been filed in court. What about the phrase to deliver to the proper judicial authorities? What does this phrase mean? This means the filing of a criminal case in court, not the filing of the inquest complaint before the fiscal. Now, after the accused is arrested without warrant, he must be brought before the fiscal for the conduct of an inquest proceeding. Now, what's an inquest proceeding? An inquest is an informal and summary investigation conducted by a public prosecutor in criminal cases involving persons arrested without warrant for the purpose of determining whether or not said persons should remain under custody and correspondingly charged in court. So inquest is always associated with situations involving persons arrested without a warrant of arrest. Now, if the fiscal finds that the warrantless arrest was not valid, he shall dismiss the case and order the release of the person arrested. On the other hand, if the fiscal finds that the warrantless arrest was valid, he shall then determine if there is probable cause to file an information against the person arrested. Otherwise, he shall dismiss the case. Let me show you a sample of an inquest case flow. So, as you can see, here X is a policeman who saw Y kill Z in his presence. X thereafter arrested Y. So the crime committed by Y here is either murder or homicide. X then brings Y before the fiscal for inquest. And then the fiscal finds the arrest valid and proceeds to determine if there is probable cause. The fiscal finds probable cause and then prepares the resolution and information. And then after preparing the resolution and information, the fiscal then files the information in court. Now, since the crime committed by Y here is murder or homicide, it is considered as a grave offense. And for purposes of Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code, for grave offenses, the reglementary period is 36 hours counted from the time of the arrest. Now, the rule requires that the inquest proceeding 
to include the filing of the information in court must all be completed within 36 hours. Otherwise, if no information is filed after the lapse of the 36-hour reglementary period, the person or the arresting officer having custody of the arrested person is obligated to release the arrested person. Otherwise, the arrested person may be held, rather, the person having custody of the arrested person may be held liable for arbitrary detention under Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. Now, let us say, after the fiscal finds the arrest valid or after the fiscal receives the complaint filed by the police officer, the fiscal finds the arrest not properly effected. What shall he do? He shall then order the release of Y in this example. Or if the fiscal finds the arrest not properly effected but the evidence on hand warrants the conduct of a regular preliminary investigation, the fiscal shall still order the release of the arrested person but he will proceed to conduct a preliminary investigation since he finds some evidence to continue with the investigation. Or if the fiscal finds the arrest valid but why the arrested person here desires to avail of a preliminary investigation, why must first sign a waiver of Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code? So, as you can see here, this is a sample inquest case flow which sort of summarizes everything we have discussed in this video. Now, the term probable cause for purposes of filing an information or a criminal case in court has been defined as such facts as are sufficient to engender a well-founded belief that a crime has been committed and that the respondent is probably guilty thereof and should be held for trial. This is the quantum of evidence required for purposes of filing an information. Now, if the fiscal finds probable cause to file a criminal case or an information in court, within what period should the fiscal file such information? The answer is it depends. Because if what is involved is a grave felony or its equivalent, the fiscal should file the information within 36 hours counted from the time of the arrest. If what is involved is a less grave felony or its equivalent, then the fiscal should file the information within 18 hours from the time of the arrest. And if what is involved is a light felony or its equivalent, then he should file the information within 12 hours counted also from the time of the arrest. Now, for crimes punished under the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020 or Republic Act 11479, take note that a suspected terrorist or a person arrested for violating or for committing any of the punishable acts in the said anti-terror law, that person can be detained for a maximum of 24 days. And the arresting officers, even if the detention goes beyond 36 hours because the law clearly provides that the arrested person can be detained for a maximum of 24 days, they will not be deemed to have violated Article 125 of the Revised Penal Code. This is the exception to the rule found in Article 125. How do we know if a felony or an offense is light, less grave, or grave? Article 9 of the Revised Penal Code provides. Grave felonies are those to which the law attaches the capital punishment or penalties which in any of their periods are afflictive in accordance with Article 25 of the Revised Penal Code. 
Less grave felonies are those which the law punishes with penalties which in their maximum period are correctional in accordance with the above-mentioned article. Light felonies are those infractions of law for the commission of which a penalty of arresto minor or a fine not exceeding 40,000 pesos or both is provided. So, for light felonies, the penalty is arresto minor or a fine not exceeding 40,000 pesos or both. For less grave felonies, the penalties here are arresto mayor and prison correctional. For grave felonies, the penalties here are or starts from prison mayor, reclusion temporal, reclusion perpetua, and it even includes life imprisonment because Article 125 uses the phrase or their equivalent. So if a crime, for example, is or has an imposable penalty of life imprisonment, then it is considered as a grave felony or a grave offense. And in such a case, if it is considered as a grave felony, then the reglementary period is 36 hours. If it is considered a less grave felony, the reglementary period is 18 hours. And if it is considered as a light felony, because it has, a, it has an imposable penalty only of arresto minor or a fine not exceeding 40,000 pesos or both, then it only has a reglementary period of 12 hours. All of these hours, 36, 18, and 12, are to be reckoned or counted from the time of the arrest. Question. What happens when the fiscal fails to file an information in court within 12, 18, or 36 hours counted from the time of the arrest? Answer. The arrested person who is detained must be set free or released. Otherwise, the public officer detaining the said person will be liable for arbitrary detention under Article 125 if he continues to detain the arrested person beyond the 12, 18, or 36-hour reglementary period, as the case may be. This is what is meant by the phrase, delay in the delivery of detained persons to the proper judicial authorities. Suppose the 12, 18, or 36-hour falls at a time when the courthouse is already or still closed. Can the fiscal file the information beyond the said hours without violating Article 125? The answer is yes, provided that the information is filed on the first office day following the lapse of the said reglementary period. This is more of the exception because there are times when the 36th hour or the 18th hour or the 12th hour, as the case may be, falls at a time when the office of the clerk of court is closed, meaning to say it is physically impossible to file an information in court by having it received by the clerk of court. So this is the reason why the law allows the prosecutor or the fiscal concern to file the information even beyond the 12, 18, or 36-hour reglementary period provided that he files the same on the first office day following the lapse of the said reglementary period. We are now in Article 126, the crime of delaying release. The penalties provided for in Article 124 shall be imposed upon any public officer or employee who delays for the period of time specified therein the performance of any judicial or executive order for the release of a prisoner or detention prisoner or unduly delays the service of the notice of such order to said prisoner or the proceedings upon any petition for the liberation of such person. Let us examine its elements. Number one, the offender is a public officer or employee. They refer to wardens and jailers or 
to any person having custody in the meantime of a detention prisoner, like police officers. Number two, there is a judicial or executive order for the release of a prisoner or detention prisoner, like judges ordering the release of a detention prisoner, or a prosecutor ordering the release of the arrested person during the inquest proceedings. Or there is a proceeding upon a petition for the liberation of such person. And number three, the offender without good reason delays the performance of a judicial or executive order for the release of said prisoner, the service of the notice of such order to said prisoner, or the proceedings upon any petition for the release of such person. So, for example, there is already an order from the judge to release the accused, but the jailer refused to release the accused notwithstanding that order of release. And he only released the accused after, despite having received the order of release, he only released the accused after several days. He will be liable under this article. Let's go to the last article for this video, the crime of expulsion in Article 127. The penalty of prison correctional shall be imposed upon any public officer or employee who, not being thereto authorized by law, shall expel any person from the Philippine Islands or shall compel such person to change his residence. What are the elements here? Number one. The offender is a public officer or employee. Number two, he expels any person from the Philippines or compels a person to change his residence. And number three, he is not authorized to do so by law. In one case, the Supreme Court ruled that there must be an order from the President or from the Commissioner of the Bureau of Immigration and Deportation before aliens can be deported. Courts also may, after final judgment, sentence an accused to distiero or banishment or as a condition in his probation. So, you can see here that only public officers like the President or the Commissioner of the Bureau of Immigration and Deportation or judges you know, may compel a person to change his residence or expel a person from the Philippines or expel meaning deport a person from the Philippines. If a public officer forcibly expels a person from the Philippines without any court order without an order from the President or from the Bureau of Immigration, then he will be liable under this article, the crime of expulsion.